Amos 1-2, God holds all to account. The best of times, the most unethical of times. Today we start a four-part series on the book of the prophet Amos. So we're traveling back in time about 28 centuries. Amos prophesied about 760 to 750 BC. Now you might suppose times were very different back then. Yet there are definite parallels to our setting today in affluent Western society. By the way, did you hear that according to U.S. News & World Report, in 2021 Canada scored the highest ranking of the countries in the world in terms of best place to live? We were number two out of 78 countries in 2020. We also placed in top spot in the categories of quality of life and social purpose. So with that in mind, let's hear about the setting in which Amos came on the scene to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BC. It was a golden age unlike any period since King David and King Solomon back around 1000 BC. To set the stage, here's an excerpt from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. Elisha was able to leave behind him the promise of a new day of victory. It was in the peace and liberty of this day that Israel rose a step in civilization. The prophecy released from the defense became the criticism of the national life and that the people no longer absorbed in their own borders looked out and for the first time realized the great world of which they were only a part. King Joash, whose arms the dying Elisha had blessed, won back in the 16 years of his reign, 798 to 783, the cities which the Syrians had taken from his father. His successor, Jeroboam II, came in, therefore, with a flowing tide. He was a strong man, and he took advantage of it. During his long reign of about 40 years, 783 to 743, he restored the border of Israel from the pass of Hamath between the Lebanons to the Dead Sea and occupied at least part of the territory of Damascus. This means that the constant raids to which Israel had been subjected now ceased, and that by the time of Amos, about 755, a generation was grown up who had not known defeat, and the most of whom had perhaps no experience even of war. Along the same length of years, Isaiah, circa 778 to 740, had dealt similarly with Judah. He had pushed south to the Red Sea, while Jeroboam pushed north to Hamath. And while Jeroboam had taken the Syrian towns, he had crushed the Philistine. He had re reorganized the army and invented new engines of siege for casting stones. On such of his frontiers as were opposed to the desert, he had built towers, all this meant such security across broad Israel as had not been known since the glorious days of Solomon. Agriculture must everywhere have revived. Isaiah, the chronicler tells us, loved husbandry. But we hear most of trade and building. With quarters in Damascus and a port on the Red Sea, with allies in the Phoenician towns and tributaries in the Philistine, with command of all the main routes between Egypt and the north as between the desert and the Levant, Israel, during those 40 years of Jeroboam and Isaiah, must have become a busy and a wealthy commercial power. Hosea calls the northern kingdom a very Canaan, Canaanite being the Hebrew term for traitor. Amos exposes all the restlessness, the greed, and the indifference to the poor of a community making haste to be rich. The first effect of this was a large increase of the towns and of town life. Every document of the time, up to 720, speaks to us of its buildings, vast palaces, the name of them first heard of in Israel under Omri and his Phoenician alliance, and then only as that of the king's citadel, are now built by wealthy grandees out of money extorted from the poor. They can have risen only since the Syrian wars. There are summer houses in addition to winter houses. And it is not only the king, as in the days of Ahab, who furnishes his buildings with ivory. When an earthquake comes and whole cities are overthrown, the vigor and wealth of the people are such that they build more strongly and lavishly than ever before. With all this, we have the characteristic tempers and moods of city life, the fickleness and liability to panic which are possible only where people are gathered in crowds, the luxury and false art which are engendered only by artificial conditions of life, the deep poverty which in all cities, from the beginning to the end of time, lurks by the side of the most brilliant wealth, its dark and inevitable shadow. 
In short, in the half century between Elisha and Amos, Israel rose from one to another of the great stages of culture. Till the 8th century, they had been but a kingdom of fighting husbandmen. Under Jeroboam and Uzziah, city life was developed and civilization, in the proper sense of the word, appeared. Only once before had Israel taken so large a step, when they crossed Jordan, leaving nomadic life for the agricultural, and that had been momentous for their religion. They came among new temptations, the use of wine and the shrines of local gods who were believed to have more influence on the fertility of the land than Jehovah who had conquered it for his people. But now this further step from the agricultural stage to the mercantile and civil was equally fraught with danger. There was the closer intercourse with foreign nations and their cults. There were all the temptations of rapid wealth, all the dangers of an equally increasing poverty. The growth of comfort among the rulers meant the growth of thoughtlessness, cruelty multiplied with refinement. The upper classes were lifted away from feeling the real woes of the people. There was a well-fed and sanguine patriotism, but at the expense of indifference to social sin and want. Religious zeal and liberality increased, but they were coupled with all the proud's misunderstanding of God, an optimist faith without moral insight or sympathy. It is all this which makes the prophets of the 8th century so modern, while Elisha's life is still so ancient. With Amos, we stand among the conditions of our own day. The city has arisen. For the development of the highest form of prophecy, the universal and permanent form, there was needed that marvelously unchanging mold of human life, whose needs and sorrows, whose sins and problems, are today the same as they were all those thousands of years ago. End of quote from that commentary. I thought it set the scene pretty well for what we're going to be studying. Next section, an extraordinary, ordinary guy. The Lord uses ordinary people. The Apostle Paul was very aware of this when he wrote to the church at Corinth. At that time, people used to hide valuables in clay jars, which themselves had little value or beauty and so did not attract attention to themselves and their precious contents. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 4, 5-7, For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Jars of clay. If you're feeling a bit like a cracked pot, the light of Christ may be able to shine out through the cracks. Paul goes on to admit feeling hard-pressed on every side, perplexed, struck down, yet sustained by the Lord. If you're feeling a bit beaten up or worn down by life, take heart. God's power is available and brings him glory shining out through folks like you when you lean into him. Anyway, back to Amos, who was a rather ordinary Job. In the first verse of his book, he identifies himself as one of the shepherds of Tekoa. Later in chapter 7, he admits, Amos 7:14, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. For the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Amos' awareness of Middle Eastern geography and politics shows he was not an ignorant peasant, but neither was he middle or upper class. God used a shepherd, a horticulturist, to head out of the country, the southern kingdom of Judah, to go to the worship center of the northern kingdom, Israel, the breakaway ten tribes, to deliver God's warning and call them back to himself. You've got to admire Amos's pluck and bravery and dedicated obedience. He was taking a real risk, challenging the prosperous and powerful national leaders of a neighboring country to repent. Today it might be like a dairy farmer from Huron County heading to Washington, D.C. to challenge practices there. But Amos was faithful to God's call. Next section. The coming fire, enough is enough. Chapter 1 and the start of chapter 2 address the surrounding pagan nations. 
Amos uses a repetitive format to convey a judgment on each of them. For example, 1, 3 to 4, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of blank, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because she blank, I will send fire upon blank, that will consume the fortresses of blank. What's this for three sins, even for four business? Well, it's a rhetorical style that emphasizes the quantity he's talking about. As in, three would be enough to fill it, but four means it's going to overflow. Thus, Amos proceeds through a list of seven surrounding nations to highlight their transgressions before zeroing in on Israel as the final target. God is about to send fire upon their fortresses, their proud defenses they are trusting in. Within just three decades at 722 BC, Assyria would sweep through the region and Israel as a nation would be obliterated, its people exiled, foreign immigrants brought in forcibly to replace the local population. In about 30 years. Think about the length of time from 1990 until now. That's all the time that's left for Israel to go from its greatest height of power to being essentially wiped off the map. Next section, heathen nations not exempt. Amos places Israel's judgment plunk in the middle of judgment upon foreign pagan nations. 1, 1 to 2, 3 lists six heathen nations that do not have God's law. Syria, capital Damascus, Philistia, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. God is holding them responsible even though Moses did not convey the Ten Commandments or other Jewish laws to them. God holds all people to account. God our Creator has wired humans to possess the faculty called conscience, which helps us know the difference between right and wrong, and signals guilt in our inner being when we're treated when we treated others poorly or refused to acknowledge the Creator who put us here. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Rome talks about how all people are accountable to God and subject to his judgment by virtue of what should be obvious to them because of the innate abilities God has given them. We have no excuse for going against God. We cannot plead ignorance. Romans 1, 18 to 20. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Then in the next chapter, Paul identifies the special inner capacity people have to gauge right and wrong, what we call conscience. Romans 2.14 Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. So even though these neighboring heathen nations have not had the benefit of knowing the law revealed through Moses, God nevertheless warns them of coming doom on account of various trespasses. What have they done wrong? Well, in a couple of cases, they have been barbaric and brutal in conflict. 1-3. This is what the Lord says, For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. Having heavy sledges pulled by horses were pulled over wheat and barley to separate the kernels and cut up the straw. Can you imagine heavy sledges with iron teeth being pulled over human victims? Barbaric. Even more grotesque is what the Ammonites did. 1, 13 to 14. This is what the Lord says, For three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his borders, I will set fire to the walls of Rava that will consume her fortresses amid war cries on the day of battle amid violent winds on a stormy day. Absolutely brutal. Not only merciless on the poor pregnant women, it totally disregards the value of the life of the unborn. We've come a long way today, haven't we? 
We have codes of conduct in warfare. We have the Geneva Convention to dictate how prisoners of war should be treated. We have legalized abortion in Canada, essentially throughout the whole term of pregnancy. Brutal. Barbaric. Thankfully, where there is repentance, Jesus heals and forgives. That is grace. Another sin Amos calls out amongst the pagan nations is lack of compassion, particularly where there should be consideration of her previous relationship. Look at the judgment against Edom in 111. You may recall Edom means red and stands for the descendants of Jacob's twin brother Esau, who were neighbors of the Jews on their southern border. 111. This is what the Lord says, For three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because he pursued his brother with a sword, stifling all compassion, because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked. Not having compassion on our own relatives. Maybe we don't pursue our kinsmen with a sword, but have you noticed how easy it is to be nice to those outside your home, yet reserve your moodiness and grumpiness and harshest criticism for your own family members? Can you think of any families in the community that are at odds because of estate squabbles? One party perceives things did not get divided up fairly when the parent died. Are there cases where a son or daughter has been written off because they got into drugs or the wrong crowd or acted out sexually? Sometimes we may find it hard to be compassionate to those who are our own relatives. Lord, have mercy. A couple of the nations are called out on account of human trafficking, dealing in slavery. There's the Philistines in 1.6. This is what the Lord says, For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. And the nation city of Tyre in 1.9. This is what the Lord says, For three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom, disregarding a treaty of brotherhood. Human trafficking is still a big problem today. The American Civil War may have ended outright oppression of African Americans in traditional slavery, but sex trafficking continues all over the Western world today. Prince Andrew was in the news this past week, no longer to be called His Royal Highness, having relegated any remaining royal privileges and honorary military positions back to the crown on account of a civil case brought against him by a woman who was purportedly trafficked by Ghislaine Maxwell years ago in his association with Jeffrey Epstein, charges the prince continues to deny. Affluence and power brings with them expanded opportunities for temptation and using other people. We're supposed to love people and use things, not the other way around, love things and use people. Next section, especially accountable in light of God's truth. By beginning with half a dozen neighboring pagan nations, Amos makes it clear God is not unfairly singling out the northern kingdom for judgment. All people will be held to account. The Apostle Paul, in a sermon before the court at Athens, the Areopagus, it said in Acts 17, 30-31, In the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Note the emphasis on universality of judgment. Commands all people everywhere to repent. He will judge the world with justice. He has given proof of this to all men. Christianity isn't just relevant to those who call themselves Christians. Jesus took on the form of humanness of all people to be the judge of all and savior of those who repent, for whom he has purchased forgiveness from their sins. Now Amos turns to Judah and Israel, the tribes of Israel that received God's special revelation in the scriptures and ought to have known better. Unlike the pagan nations who had to rely on conscience, not well-communicated specifics. This rejection of the law by Judah is the basis for God's pronouncement of a warning, Amos 2.4. This is what the Lord says, For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees. 
because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors followed. I will send fire upon Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. They rejected God's law, disobeying his teachings, and were seduced by worshiping false gods. Still today, when we reject what God has shown in the Bible, we become more susceptible to the deceptive false gods culture at large worships, gods of sex, money, and power. As for the northern kingdom of Israel, the northern ten tribes that broke off from Solomon's son Rehoboam and formed a distinct political entity, Amos provides a short list of ways they've broken God's laws and failed to love their neighbor. He'll expand on this in later chapters, but here's a broad overview. Amos 2, 6-8 This is what the Lord says, For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God they drink wine taken as fines. Remember the historical setting here. Business is booming. People are building private palaces, adding cottages to their regular homes. Merchants are maximizing profits from the lucrative trade routes over which the government has control. But riches have not translated into righteousness. Instead, it's just like Moses warned the Israelites back in Deuteronomy 8 when they were standing at the brink of the promised land. Deuteronomy 8, 11, 14 to 14. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When times are tough, we are more inclined to turn to God, to cry out to him. But when times are easy, when the money's flowing and affluence is building and our assets are increasing, it's easy for our heart to become proud. It's all too easy to forget God and suppose we can do it on our own. Is that true for any of us today? What's our need of God gauge reading? And when we become proud and self-satisfied, we become selfish, less generous, less caring. The Northern Kingdom saw justice and righteousness being eroded. Bribes greased palms and swayed verdicts. Debtors were sold into slavery for the mere price of a pair of shoes. Poor people were ignored in court. Judges pandered to the wealthy and were rewarded for it outside the courtroom. Fertility cult worship was popular. The ancient Baal religion taught that sex with shrine prostitutes helped guarantee a fertile harvest in the field. So many males used the same woman sexually as part of the fertility cult rituals. The law of Moses taught a poor person's garment taken in pledge was to be returned to them by nightfall, and a widow's garment was not to be taken under any circumstances, but this rule was ignored. And then those garments were used as bedding beside the altars to the fertility gods. Fines were extorted from victims in corrupt court processes, and, and then that money used to buy wine to drink as part of pagan worship, a sort of double slap in the face against the Lord. Next section, are we forgetting grace? At this point in the pandemic, seeming round two, it's easy to have a case of the COVID grumps. The darkness and coldness of this time of year doesn't help. It's easy to be less patient with people, to snap at them, to feel those who don't see things our way are our enemies. It's easy to forget God's grace and be grumpy instead of grateful. I close with some verses in which Amos reminds the unfaithful nation of the ways God has been their Savior and shown them much grace. Amos 2, 9-11 I destroyed the Amorite before them, though he was tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. 
I brought you up out of Egypt and I led you 40 years in the desert to give you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up prophets from among your sons and Nazarites from among your young men. Is this not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord. Today we might say after making our point, isn't that right? Totally true. God had brought them out of slavery into this fruitful land and raised up leaders who gave them spiritual guidance based on his laws. They had received much grace. They owed him their obedience. It was an indisputable fact. From our vantage point in history, how much more grace have we been the recipients of? God sent Jesus to teach us his great commandment and great commission and a wealth of other divine truth by which to live our life. God raised Jesus from the dead to give us righteousness in his sight, to replace our guilt and rebellion. How much more grace have we obtained as sheer gift? What response does such an abundance of grace call forth? Let's pray. Righteous God, in Amos' prophecy, we see a mirror held up to our own society. We've been intent on building our palaces instead of protecting the poor. We have overlooked shabby treatment of justice as long as it meant we could get ahead, whether wearing clothes made in sweatshops or getting our manufacturing done overseas so we didn't have to breathe the fumes. We tolerate a little bit of immorality in our entertainment as long as the kids aren't around to watch it. We show disregard for your day and your laws, then wonder why society is falling apart. Forgive us, Lord. Thank you for your grace made so very real in Jesus Christ and by your Holy Spirit coming into our lives, pricking our conscience, turning us to you. We want to heed your warning and wake up to your call and the needs of others around us. In Jesus' name, amen.